Welcome everyone to our third lecture on prokaryotes. Today we are going to be taking a look at bacterial ecology, or in other words, how bacteria interact with their environment. And the first question we have to ask is, are bacteria helpful or harmful? Now when most people hear the word bacteria, they think, oh gross, germs. But that's not an entirely accurate picture of how bacteria interact with us and with their environment. So there are a few estimates on this, but most Scientists estimate that about 1 to 5 percent of the bacteria that we run into in a daily basis are going to be harmful to us, which leaves 95 to 99 percent of the bacteria that we run into in our day-to-day -day lives as helpful or harmless to us. So today we are going to take a look at how these bacteria can be helpful and harmful. And we're going to start with the helpful ones, and in particular, helpful bacteria in the body. Now, one way that bacteria are helpful in the body is they help us synthesize or make vitamin K, which is important for blood clotting, and vitamin B12. And as we learn more and more about the microbiome, um, it is thought that bacteria help us synthesize actually a number of vitamins and other key factors for our body. Another way that bacteria help us in our bodies is by keeping out harmful bacteria. And there's a couple ways they do this. One is by producing chemicals to directly kill these bad bacteria because they see them as competitors. Another way is if you have good bacteria taking up all the space in your intestine, for example, then bad bacteria simply aren't going to have um, any space to start growing on. This is a little bit like when you go into the lunchroom, if all the seats are taken, you're not going to be able to find a place to sit. Same thing with the bacteria in your intestine. Another way that bacteria can help us is by helping with digestion. And bacteria particularly help us with digesting starches, fiber, and dairy products. And then lastly, and this doesn't apply to humans, but to uh, several ocean animals, is some bacteria can be um, bioluminescent, meaning the living things that produce light, and they are mutualists that live inside other organisms. So for example, the um, anglerfish in Finding Nemo, okay? This anglerfish, it glows, but it doesn't glow on its own. The glow actually comes from bacteria that live inside the anglerfish's body. And if you think about this evolutionarily, it's a lot easier to evolve a relationship with a glowing bacteria than it is to evolve the genes to be able to glow yourself. So that's four ways bacteria are helpful in the body. Now, how are they helpful in the environment? One way that most people are aware of is they are key decomposers. Okay, they help us break down um, formerly living material. And as decomposers, they are also important to nutrient cycling. So nutrient cycling is kind of the way that we talk about um, how elements like nitrogen and carbon get cycled through living things back and then decomposed back into soil and then brought back into plants and living things over and over again. Now one of the nutrient cycles that bacteria are especially important for is the nitrogen cycle. And this is because in this cycle they do more than just um, decompose. There are some bacteria called nitrogen fixers. And these nitrogen fixing bacteria, what they do is they convert gaseous nitrogen to forms that plants can use, like nitrate and nitrite. Now, why do they have to do this? Part of this, so the air around us is actually 78% nitrogen. However, plants can't use any of this, even though nitrogen is a limiting factor for plants. And so these nitrogen-fixing bacteria, once they convert it, the plants can then use it. Now, one interesting application of this is something called rhizobial bacteria. So rhizobial bacteria are nitrogen-fixing bacteria that live in the roots of plants like legumes. Okay. 
And so legumes are things like peas and peanuts and soybeans and clover. We do sometimes find them in other plants as well. Um, and so when they live in the roots, they form these little nodules on the roots. If you dig up some clover in your yard, you'll probably see some of these, right? So they form these little nodules and each nodule is full of the rhizobial bacteria. Now the rhizobial bacteria from this relationship, they get sugar from the plant that they're living in and shelter. The plant gets a ready source of nitrogen. They don't even have to work to take it out of the soil. This rhizobial bacteria is actually what underlies crop rotation. So if you plant a crop like peanuts that has rhizobial bacteria after a crop like cotton that drains the nitrogen from the soil, the peanuts actually add nitrogen back to the soil and it's a way of refertilizing the soil and getting a productive crop at the same time. All right, so let's move on to helpful bacteria in industry. We use bacteria to help us make a variety of foods um, for starters. One of those is cheese. If you've ever seen the holes in Swiss cheese, those holes are actually kind of like bacteria burps. Um, when bacteria respire, they give off carbon dioxide just like you do. What happens in cheese though is that carbon dioxide can't freely float away. It's kind of stuck in the cheese and they come together like the bubbles in your soda to make bigger and bigger bubbles. So that's where the holes in Swiss cheese come from. It's from bacteria. We also use bacteria to help us make things like yogurt as well as some fermented things like kimchi, pickles, and kombucha. And then we also use it to help us make chocolate. So chocolate, when it comes off the tree, is actually left to rot for a little while. This helps it give, its give it its characteristic flavor, and some of that rotting is accomplished by bacteria. We can also use bacteria to help us make medicines. And this can happen in a couple of different ways. One, we can actually um, use bacteria to make antibiotics because the antibiotics, or the bacteria naturally produce these antibiotics to kill other bacteria. Another way that we use bacteria to create medicines is we genetically engineer the bacteria to produce the medicines. And one great example of this, one of the first examples, is insulin. All right, so insulin is typically made in our, in our pancreas. It's, it helps us regulate our blood sugar. When you have diabetes, you typically have a lack or not enough insulin and have trouble regulating your blood sugar. Um, so what happens is insulin is one of those uh, compounds that we have not been able to create a synthetic version of. And we used to have to farm it from animals in order to give it to diabetics. Um, however, what they did was they cut out the gene for insulin and put it into a bacteria on a little plasmid and then they can reproduce those bacteria. And bacteria are way easier to grow than animals. So now the bacteria make the insulin and they can make it in larger quantities and for cheaper than when we were harvesting it from animals, which makes it more readily available. Another way that we can have harmful, or I'm sorry, helpful bacteria in industry is we often use them for pest control. Um, Dipel dust, for example, is actually bacterial spores that when you sprinkle it, um, those bacteria, they come back out of dormancy and they will actually kill some of the pests that are in the soil and some insects. Um, so that our crops can grow, but it's more of a natural treatment than pesticides. All right, so now let's turn our attention to our harmful bacteria. One of the ways harmful, bac harmful bacteria affect us in industry is through crop spoilage and rot. Most of us have experienced this in a small way if we take something home from the grocery store and it goes bad before we can eat it. But this also occurs out in the fields and before foods even get to market. Um, another factor is agricultural disease. And so between the crop rot and agricultural disease, um, these two can cost billions of dollars in revenue every year. And now everyone's favorite or the one we're most excited for is harmful bacteria in the body. We're going to look at a few different categories of these. The first one is our dysenteries. 
Dysentery is just really severe diarrhea, and there's a lot of different bacteria that can cause this. The first one right here is Listeria. You may remember the Listeria outbreak in ice cream a few years ago. The second one here is Cholera. All right, cholera used to be a big deal, um, largely before the advent of modern sewer systems. We then also have E. coli. You may remember the E. coli outbreak in lettuce recently, as well as Shigella. All right, another form of food poisoning. We can also have Bacillus cereus. This is more commonly found on rice that is improperly cooked or stored. And then we also have Salmonella which is typically picked up through raw meat, especially raw poultry. Um, you can get it from birds or reptiles. And then its cousin, typhoid fever or typhus, um, which combines the diarrhea systems with some more respiratory systems and high fever. We can then also have, let me remember what this last one is, oh yeah. C. diff, Clostridium difficile. This is a really nasty one that tends to show up in hospitals and nursing homes. And then last but not least is Campylobacter. Um, Campylobacter, they've done some research on bacteria shaped like this one recently that also infect the intestine. And they're starting to find out that this corkscrew shape actually helps the Campylobacter and its relatives burrow into our intestinal walls. All right, so we're also gonna look with these diseases at which ones we have vaccines for. And of all of these dysenteries, the only one we have a vaccine for is cholera, and that's still in a bit of its developmental stages. It's not widely distributed. All right, so let's move from the intestines to the skin. All right, so our skin and flesh diseases. Our major one, the one that we see most commonly, is a staph infection, which is short for staphylococcus. However, we also have its cousin, MRSA, which is the antibiotic resistant version of Staphylococcus aureus, okay? We then have leprosy, which causes um, skin lesions. This is also not as big a deal now that we have antibiotics, but it used to be a very, um, a disease with a lot of social effects to it. We have gangrene which typically causes wounds to get infected, and then oftentimes those limbs have to be amputated. Um, this was a common problem prior to the advent of antibiotics, so World War I and earlier. We also have flesh-eating bacteria, also called necrotizing fasciitis. This one, like its name suggests, eats away at your flesh, and we don't have any vaccines for these four. Next, we'll move to the lung and the throat. One of the ones is anthrax. Um, anthrax is typically found in livestock. It can affect humans, but it's a lot more rare. We also have tuberculosis. Um, in Victorian times, this was called consumption. It often causes people to cough up blood. Whooping cough, also known as pertussis, which causes severe coughing that makes it difficult to breathe. And then we also have pneumonia, which is an infection that causes fluid in the lungs. Now, not every pneumonia is caused by bacteria, but many are caused by this pneumococcal bacteria. All right, then we also have strep throat, and the strep in strep throat is short for streptococcus. And if you remember, strepto means chain, which we can see right here, and coccus means circle, and so we can see the chain of circular bacteria. And then lastly, we also have Legionnaire's disease. Um, this one is another infection of the lungs that is um, typically spread when some kind of contaminated water is sprayed in the air, like through a fountain or a hot tub or something like that. Among these lung and throat diseases, the ones we have vaccines for are anthrax, although that's not typically given to us here in the US, unless you're in the military. Tuberculosis, which is no longer really applied in the US, but you sometimes get it overseas. Whooping cough and pneumonia. Okay, so now let's move on to our harmful bacteria, other harmful bacteria in the body. One of those is pimples. Um, pimples are caused by bacteria that live in your skin that your pores get covered up, the pimple bacteria multiply, can escape, um, and they form those bumps on your skin. We can also have bad breath caused by bacteria, as well as cavities, which are caused by bacteria that eat into the enamel of your teeth. Um, interestingly, among these, 
they are starting to work on a vaccine for pimples, which would be great. All right, and then lastly, some other harmful bacteria in the body include things like tetanus, which you can get from rusty metal, botulism, which comes from improperly canned foods. However, small doses of the toxin produced by the botulism bacteria are actually what we use to make Botox. Okay. We can also have ulcers, which are sores in the stomach, um, meningitis, which is an infection of the fluid around your spinal cord, syphilis, which is an STD, Lyme disease, which is carried by ticks, and the Black Plague, which killed about a third of Europe in the 1300s. This one is actually not a dangerous to us anymore because we have antibiotics that are able to kill it. So among this last slide, the ones that we have vaccines for are tetanus, meningitis, and that's it. Okay. So now let's think about how these harmful bacteria spread. One way that bacteria spread are through skin-to-skin -skin contact. And then also through skin-to-surface contact, like if you touch a dirty table. They can also be spread through body fluids, whether that is through snot or blood. They can be spread through contaminated water. Oftentimes, that contaminated water is contaminated with waste, whether that is, um, and often that's fecal waste. We can get it through contaminated food. And then sometimes it can get aerosolized, like if someone coughs on you. So now that we know how these bacteria spread and how they impact us, be on the lookout for, how the, for these harmful bacteria and how you can protect yourself against them. Thank you for joining us today and we'll see you next time for viruses.